Have you ever wondered what evolutionists really think about creationism? Like what about evolutionary college professors? Do they even mention creationism to their students? And if so, what do they even say about it? Well today, we're going to take a behind the scenes look at how public universities portray creationism. Hello and welcome back to the New Creation channel. My name is Peter and today we're going to do something a little bit different. Now to kind of set the story for you, I am a young earth creationist, but I attend a public university where they teach evolution. And I don't usually get into debates or discussions with my professors about evolution versus creation, but I do talk about it fairly occasionally with some of my classmates. Well, one day I happened to be kind of discussing it with a classmate and it turned out that they were in the intro to evolution class. And they mentioned that earlier that day, in fact, they had a lecture about creationism and kind of contrasting creationism with evolutionary thought. So I thought that that would be an interesting thing to share with you, to look at how professors at public universities are representing creationism, because apparently they are talking about it. So I'm interested to see what exactly they're telling students about creationism and how accurate and up to date that information is. So let's start with this slide here. For some context, this is part of a much larger PowerPoint. I've taken out quite a few slides because of how long it was and kind of taken the ones that I thought were the most interesting and essential to this discussion here. This one is kind of the first slide in the PowerPoint that really contrasted evolutionary thought with creationism. And it says, prior to the development of evolutionary theory, the leading hypothesis explaining the origin of species was the theory of special creation. And then they have kind of three bullet points here, which are presumably the three tenets of special creation. And these three points are, Species were unchanged since their creation, immutable. Variation within species was limited. And Earth was young, created on October 23rd, 4004 BC at 9 AM. So the supposed very first tenant of the theory of special creation is that species are immutable. But are you kidding me? If you look at the website of literally any moderately influential creation ministry around today, you will find that not a single one would argue that species are immutable. To be quite frank, this isn't even a good description of creation science in the 1700s. Back then, there was Carl Linnaeus, a very famous and influential taxonomist. He was a creationist. Earlier in life, he did believe in species fixity, but later in life, he actually came around and argued that new species could originate, and he argued that they came about through hybridization of existing species. But the point is, this idea that species are immutable is not held by creationists today. And even a hundred years prior to the publishing of The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, influential creationists we're already moving away from the idea that species were unchanging. So the second tenant of the theory of special creation is that variation within species was limited. At first, I wasn't actually sure what to make of that. Like, what do you even mean by that? Of course, variation within species is limited, right? But I realized that that wasn't what he was talking about at all. Instead, this language is all very confusing because He's mixing up different terms. He's mixing up the idea of a biological species with the idea of a biological kind. And those two things are not the same. A biological species is a group of organisms which can all interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. That's different from the idea of a biblical kind. Creationists believe that God created kinds, so groups of organisms that are morphologically similar and can interbreed in the beginning and that since creation, they have changed and diversified to make many new species. So a kind can actually encompass a whole bunch of species. So clearly these two concepts aren't the same and he's mixing them up. So if we kind of substitute the word species in his sentence there for the word kind, his tenant is that variation within kinds was limited. 
that makes a little more sense. And some creationists to do today do actually advocate for the idea that variation within kinds is limited. What that means is that even given kind of, you know, an infinite amount of time, a member of a kind can only change so much. There's a finite number of ways in which it could change. It can't just change, you know, infinitely into a whole bunch of different types. I'm not sure whether that's correct or that. There could be boundaries around kinds. There might not be. I feel like that'd be hard to prove either way. But I think what's actually most important here is less this tenant and what he's trying to say about it, and rather his misuse of the term species, right? This is very interesting. And it, it might actually, now that I'm looking at it, apply to the first tenant that we talked about, the kinds were immutable. He is kind of, um, whether it's accidental or not, you know, straw manning creationists here, right? We don't say that species are immutable, but he is kind of playing with words here. And instead of using the word kind, using the word species, but those two things don't correlate. So whether he knows it or not, he's presenting kind of an inaccurate view of what creationists actually believe. Now the third and final tenant of the theory of special creation is that Earth was young, created on October 23, 4004 BC at 9 a.m. This one is just ridiculous, okay? I've talked to lots of creationists, and none of the creationists that they've ever talked to have argued that Bishop Usher's chronology was certainly correct. This uh, date here that he's trying to provide here comes from Bishop Usher, who was an archbishop who tried to calculate the age of the earth. He made some kind of extra biblical assumptions about how exactly, you know, time is needed to align and things needed to line up with equinoxes and all of that sorts of stuff that I think is incorrect. And that's how we arrived at a specific date and time. But literally no creationists today are arguing that Bishop Usher was exactly correct on the date and the time of creation. Because the Bible, in actual gene genealogies of the Bible, which are used to calculate these dates, are not precise enough to come up with a particular day or a particular time. Okay, but the more general point which I want you to see here is what a straw man this is, right? If you're an outsider looking in at this and you say, oh wow, that group of people believes that they can pinpoint the very date and hour at which the world was made. Right? You can kind of laugh at them and make fun of them. And so this is obviously a straw man intended to kind of demonstrate that creationists have misplaced confidence in the dating of the world. Before we move on to the next slide, there's one last little statement here at the bottom which I have to read you. Scientific theories often have statement of fact followed by processes responsible for producing the pattern, dot, dot, dot. So the implication is, oh, we, we have our theories, but then we also have like mechanistic ways in which we can kind of demonstrate how, you know, our theories work. And creationists, you know, they don't have a scientific theory showing how the earth can be created out of nothing. I mean, uh, of course, the entire point of the creationist is that organisms were made supernaturally. They were not made through some scientific process. They were made by God. So. Why would you expect us to give you some sort of scientific theory about how organisms were made? Now, in hindsight, we can go and look at what God made and describe it and come up with ideas about how God planned to make things and how he designed things in relation to each other. But no, we can't give you a scientific explanation of how exactly God made the world and how God made organisms because he didn't make them in a scientific way. He made them in a supernatural, miraculous way. So now we get to the section of the PowerPoint which is dedicated to evidence for evolution, right? So if by this point you haven't already been convinced that creationism is ridiculous, now we're going to prove it with vestigial organs, right? So this is the idea that over time, uh, organisms basically lose the function of body parts and they kind of become evolutionary leftovers that have limited functionality. So one of the common uh, infamous examples of this is the human tailbone, which was used in a different slide here uh, where they bring up, oh, well, humans have a tailbone and it's analogous to other organisms' tails, and therefore that proves that humans evolved from organisms with tails, right? That's kind of the argument here. We lost the function of a tail over time and now we just have a tailbone. Okay, 
But the example which I wanted to show here is this slide where they're talking about fish that have lost their eyes, cave fish, um, little birds like kiwis that are flightless and thus have little tiny wings, and then snakes that have these little tiny, tiny little structures coming out of their body that are analogous to legs. That last example is why I'm bringing this up. It was just too humorous to resist, right? The idea that snakes once had legs proves evolution. It's not as if thousands of years before Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, somebody was writing about how there was an event which caused snakes to lose legs. Oh wait, that's Moses writing Genesis in the Bible, right? <laughs> this is funny to me because they're using something which was predicted by the Bible long before evolutionists actually figured this out that snakes are built on a four-limbed body plan. The Bible was talking about this thousands of years before they ever developed this, but nope, the idea that snakes have legs is actually an evolutionary idea and proves that special creation is wrong. All right, so let's close with some concluding thoughts. First of all, evolutionists do at least mention creationism in their classes, which I guess that's a small thing, but at the, at the very least, evolutionists do bring up that creationism does exist, so, you know, credit to them for that. Secondly, they do need some improvement, right? They don't know what they're talking about, or they're just intentionally misrepresenting creationism. And I think that is very unconvincing, particularly to people like me, who know exactly what creationism says and can see right through the sorts of you know, straw man that they're making. If they actually wanted to convince creationists to become evolutionists, they should begin by accurately representing what creationism says so that they can actually deal with it, right? There were a lot of essential concepts from creationism that were just entirely missing from this PowerPoint, right? There was no mention of created kinds. Like, wow, you're talking about evolution and creation, and you're not even going to mention the idea of created kinds. Like, wow, what an oversight. So generally, because of that, I feel like they did a bad job of convincing people. So in conclusion here, evolutionists, study up on what creationists actually think before you criticize them. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please comment below. Let me know what you thought of it. Also, make sure to like and subscribe so you can see upcoming videos on this channel. Thanks for watching.